In this section, we're starting our study of partnerships. And as we know, partnerships are flow through entities, meaning they do not, in fact, pay tax at the entity level. They only pay tax through their partners. The income and items of deduction, expense, loss are going to flow through the, to the partners, and the partners are going to report this on their tax returns. So this is different than what we've been studying under corporate tax law because a corporation is a tax paying entity. A partnership is a syndicate, group, pool, joint venture, or other unincorporated organization that carries on a business or financial operation. It can't be a trust, estate, or corporation. A partnership has no formal organization requirements. So I could just go out with a friend and start conducting business and we would be a partnership by virtue of engaging in a business with the objective to make money. So two or more people engaging in an in a operation or an organization to try to raise money. A partner can be an individual or an estate trust or corporation. Partnerships must have at least two partners, but they can have an unlimited number of partners. There are two main types of partnerships and then kind of some subcategories under there. So the first is a general partnership. And that's when the partnership has no limited partners and each partner can bind the partnership. So here, everybody has unlimited liability, which means if I mess up in my business, that I can be sued, my partners can be sued, and we can lose not only our investment in the business, but all, also our personal assets, our house, our car, whatever. We can each bind the partnership. So there's no limit. I can sign contracts for the partnership without my partner's approval. Each may manage the affairs of the partnership. As you can probably predict, partners don't often like this treatment. So there's another category of partnerships called limited partnerships. And here the partnership at least has at least one limited partner and one general partner. The limited partner has limited liability, but the general partner does not. So the general partner can still be sued for everything that happens in the business and can lose his or her own personal assets. As you can also suspect, often general partners don't even like this, this structure of a limited partnership. So there are some other cre creatures of law that allow further limitations of liability. The first is the Limited Liability Limited Partnership, the LLLP. It's gonna provide the general partner with limited liability. And these, this creature is used in a state that doesn't have a Limited Liability Company Act. Most states have the LLC Act now, but not all do. So if you're in a state that doesn't, you'd form an LLLP. The LLC, Limited Liability Company, has limited liability for every owner, and it's treated as a partnership for tax purposes. We studied this in the first chapter, or I think it was actually chapter two. It's checks, check the box regulations, so this, this organization can elect to be taxed as a partnership or a corporation. And then the last one is the LLP, Limited Liability Partnership. Under this one, it provides limited liability for partners to the extent that a partner isn't going to be liable for obligations of other partners in the business. So if I am in the practice of law and I form an LLP and my partner messes something up and gets sued and loses, I am not liable for losses attributable to that beyond my original investment. I'm still, I still have unlimited liability for my screw-ups. So if I mess up and someone sues me, I can still lose my personal assets. These came into existence because a lot of professions were not allowed to be LLCs or LLLPs. Now they're allowed in almost all jurisdictions to be LLCs or LLLPs. So these are less popular. Um, so yeah, you won't see this as much anymore. Partnership taxation, as we said, partnerships are flow through entities. So partnership profits and losses are disclosed on Form 1065, which is an information return that goes to the IRS. I say they're disclosed because no money has to accompany that return. Also, a Schedule K is filed, and then each partner receives a Schedule K-1, which contains the partner share of the partnership items. These items must be reported on the individual's Schedule 1040. Um, what other things that are important in partnership taxation are basis, there is a partner's basis in the partnership. 
There's also the partnerships basis in the assets. We will talk about both of those that's referred to as inside and outside basis. But the partner's basis in the partnership begins with the amount of the initial investment, and it's adjusted for income and loss and for debts of the partnership. The partner's basis can never be negative. It can be zero. Partnership distributions to the partner's are generally not taxable at the time of distribution because the earnings have already been taxed to the partners. So the earnings are taxed when they're earned, not when they're distributed. So once the time distribution rolls around, partners generally aren't taxed. The distributions do reduce their basis because they're a return of capital. The only time this distribution would be taxed is if the partnership distribution exceeds the partner's basis. So the basis can be zero, it cannot be negative. If we start to receive distributions above the basis, that part that is taxable. And then the liquidation of a partnership interest can result in gain if it exceeds the basis. And in the event of liquidation, I may also recognize loss with some exceptions, of course. On the formation of a partnership, as you can probably guess, the code provides for non-taxation or non-taxability on the formation. So section 721A says that generally on the contribution of property, no gain or loss shall be recognized to a partnership or to any of its partners in the case of a contribution of property to the partnership in exchange for an interest in the property. Note, this is property. It doesn't include services. If I contribute services to a partnership, that's going to result in taxation to me. There's also some exceptions. First, contribution of property to a partnership that would be treated as an investment company if it were incorporated. Second, contribution of property followed by a distribution in an arrangement that may be considered a sale rather than a contribution. And third, contribution of property to a partnership along with the partnership's assumption of liabilities in the partner share of the partnership, excuse me, if the partner share of the partnership liabilities exceed his or her basis. And we're going to talk about the exceptions two and three in these later slides. So that exception two was found in section 707A2A. The treatment of certain services and transfers of property will be taxable if a partner performs services for a partnership or transfers property to a partnership, there is a related direct or indirect allocation and distribution to such partner and the performance of the services or the transfer and the allocation and distribution when viewed together are properly characterized as a transaction occurring between the partnership and a partner, acting other than his or her capacity as a member of the partnership. Such allocation and distribution shall be treated as a transaction described in paragraph one, which is what we talked about that's going to be taxable. All right, so this is services. Now section 707A2B applies to property. If there's a direct or indirect transfer of money or other property by a partner to a partnership, there is a related direct or indirect transfer of money or other property by the partnership to the partner, and the transfers described in 1 and 2 when viewed together are properly characterized as a sale or exchange of property, such transfers shall be treated as a transaction described in paragraph 1 or as a transaction between two or more partners acting other than in their capacity as members of the partnership. So these examples are in your book, but they're going to illustrate that exception. So first, in return for a 40% interest in the CD partnership, Kara contributed land worth $100,000, fair market value. The partners agreed that the partnership would distribute $100,000 in cash to Kara immediately after the contribution. Because the cash distribution would not have occurred had Kara not first contributed the land and become a partner, this transaction is likely to be treated as a sale of the land by Kara to the partnership. So what these code provisions are trying to do is trying to prevent people from essentially disguising a sale in the form of a partnership formation. So we know that the general rule is that when I contribute assets and in return receive a partnership interest, there's no tax on that transaction. But in this example one, I've contributed land, I get a partnership interest, but also the partnership agrees to distribute me cash and they distribute the exact amount of the fair market value of the land. This is a disguised sale, so this is an exception to non-recognition treatment. This is a taxable transaction. And in the second example, Elena received a 30% interest in the DEF partnership in return for her contribution of land, having a $60,000 fair market value. 
The partnership wakes six months and then distributes $60,000 in cash to Elena. If the $60,000 distribution is not contingent on the partnership's earnings or ability to borrow funds or other normal risks of doing business, the distribution and contribution will be treated as a sale of land by Elena to the partnership. Again here, Elena and the partnership tried to disguise this by waiting a little while. They waited six months, but that's not going to work either. If there was no business reason for this distribution of cash, then this is going to be treated as a sale and it will be taxable. All right, section 752 is going to deal with liabilities, and it's going to deal with the partnership assuming liabilities of the partner, and then the partner assuming liabilities of the partnership. That's going to affect the basis, the outside basis, the partner's basis in the partnership. So section 752A says there's going to be, if there is an increase in partner's liabilities, any increase in the partner's share of the liabilities of a partnership or any increase in a partner's individual liabilities by reason of the assumption by such partner of partnership liabilities shall be considered as a contribution of money by such partner to the partnership. So the basis will go up. It will be treated like the partner contributed cash. B, decrease in partner's liabilities. Any decrease in a partner's share of the liabilities of a partnership or any decrease in a partner's individual liabilities by reason of the assumption by the partnership of such individual liabilities shall be considered as a distribution of money to the partner by the partnership. The basis will go down. Liability to which property is subject. For the purposes of this section, a liability to which property is subject shall, to the extent of the fair market value of such property, be considered as a liability of the owner of the property, and then D, sale or exchange of an interest. In the case of a sale or exchange of an interest in a partnership, liabilities shall be treated in the same manner as liabilities in connection with the sale or exchange of property not associated with partnerships. Okay, so in summary, section 752, which we just read on the last slide, is going to require two adjustments in the case of a liability assumed by the partnership. The partnership partner's basis, the partner's basis in the partnership, the outside basis, is going to be increased by the share of partnership liabilities as if the partner contributed cash equal to his or her share of the liability. So that means that if the partnership has liabilities of $100,000 and the partner is a 20% partner, then the partner will increase his or her basis by $20,000, 20% of the liabilities. Okay, and then in two, the partner's basis is going to be decreased by the amount of personal liability assumed by the other partners, as if he or she had received a cash payment equal to the liability assumed. Okay, so in, seven, in part two, number two here, this is when, for example, the partner contributes an asset and it's subject to a liability and the partnership takes that liability over. So use my same example where we have a partner who's a 20% partner. And let's say that partner contributes an asset with a liability valued at $100,000. Okay, in part two, we say we're gonna decrease now the amount of the basis by the amount of personal liability assumed by the other partners as if he or she had received a cash payment. So now we're gonna decrease the basis by that amount. All right, so here we have an example. We have Suzanne and Bob, they form the SB General Partnership as equal partners. They make the following contributions. You can see the basis to the partner and you can see the fair market value of the assets. The SB Partnership assumes the $80,000 recourse mortgage on the building that Bob contributes and the partners share the economic risk of loss of the mortgage equally. Bob has claimed $40,000 in straight line depreciation under the maker's rules on the building. Suzanne is a stockbroker and contributed securities from her inventory. The partnership will hold them as an investment. A, what amount and character of gain or loss must each partner recognize on the formation of the partnership? Okay, so we know our general rule says there's no gain or loss on the formation of a partnership. We talked through some exceptions. We talked about providing services. We talked about an investment company exception, and we talked about an exception that is kind of a disguise sale. I don't see anything here 
that would fit those definitions because it doesn't look like there's a payment to the partners. No services have been contributed and it doesn't look like this would be an investment company. So part A says under section 721, neither partner is gonna recognize gain or loss on the contribution and formation of the partnership. Part B, what is each partner's basis in his or, in his or her partnership interest? Okay, so this is called outside basis and we know we start with what we contributed. So we start with the basis of the assets contributed. So for Suzanne, Suzanne contributed cash and inventory. The basis to her of each of those is $45,000 and $14,000. So we are going to start with that transferred basis. We know we also make adjustments to basis based on liabilities. And we see that the SB partnership is going to assume an $80,000 mortgage on the building. Suzanne did not contribute that building, but she is going to be liable for some of that mortgage. And let's see. Yeah, so that's the only thing we need to worry about. So we start in part B with, for Suzanne, we start with the basis of her contributed property, which looking back was 45,000 in cash plus 14,000 in, in securities. So that's 59,000, so we start there. And then remember, we add to that the share of partnership liabilities. It said in the problem they were gonna share that $80,000 mortgage equally. So we're going to add that as though she contributed cash. So the Suzanne's basis in the partnership is 99000 For Bob, we're going to start with his basis of contributed property. And it tells us right there his basis was $45,000 for the land, $50,000 for the building. So we start with that transfer $95,000 basis. To that, we add partnership liabilities. Remember that building he contributed was subject to a mortgage. Suzanne and Bob share that equally. So we increase the basis by the amount of each partner's liability. Then we decrease the basis by the partnership's assumption of the individual liabilities. And that building that Bob contributed was subject to the $80,000 of mortgage. They assumed that. So we subtract the $80,000 of mortgage all from Bob's portion because it was Bob's liability. It was not Suzanne's. That makes Bob's basis in the partnership $55,000. Part C, what's the partnership's basis in each asset? So now again, we need to figure out the partnership's basis. We start with a transferred basis. All right, so the partnership takes a carryover basis in each asset, inventory, land, and building, and then of course cash. Uh, there could be uh, some adjustments to that, but not in this problem. We don't have that present in this problem, so it's just a carryover basis. D, what's the partnership's initial book value of each asset? All right, again, that's initial book value is each asset's fair market value at the time of contribution. We haven't really talked about that, and we aren't, we aren't going to talk about that probably in, in this course. That's important when we compare the, when we determine the deferred tax asset or the deferred tax liability when we're comparing book, book taxes and tax taxes, and we have to compute the difference. E, the partnership holds the securities for two years and then sells them for $20,000. What amount and character of gain must the partnership and each partner report? All right, so the inventory has a basis to the partnership of $14,000 because remember we took the carryover basis and when they later sell it for $20,000 they realize a $6,000 gain. That's going to be just reported by the shareholders according to their interest. Now this is getting a little ahead of ourselves but if someone contributed an asset that had a built-in gain at the time of contribution they first get allocated that amount of built-in gain. So when this property was contributed, it had a $1,000 built-in gain because it had a $15,000 fair market value and a $14,000 basis. And Suzanne contributed that, in, that investment, so she gets $1,000 of the gain. And then the rest of the gain, the $5,000, is split equally. So Suzanne will have $3,500 of gain and Bob $2,500. It's going to be ordinary because the property was inventory to Susan and the partnership sold it within five years of contribution. Again, we'll talk about that rule a little bit later. 
Okay, so we talked about formation by contribution of property. Now, looking at contribution of services, we know that's going to be taxable because Section 721 said that the only thing that was not taxable was contribution of property. If a partner received a partnership interest for services, it requires the recognition of ordinary income as though he or she received cash. Ordinary income is going to be the fair market value of the partnership interest minus any cash or property contributed by the partners. Okay, so when we talk about a partnership interest, it's actually two types of interest. It's a profits interest and a capital interest. A capital interest is the right to receive assets upon liquidation, and the profits interest is a, is a future interest in the profits of the partnership. So if I receive a capital interest in return for services, it's going to require immediate taxation, and that tax value is going to be the value I would receive if the partnership was liquidated today on the date of distribution. If I receive a, part, a profits interest, it's generally not taxable on the day I receive it because it, I'm receiving a right to assets in the future. So it's generally not taxable when I receive it. There are a few exceptions that are a little bit beyond the scope of this course. They're in your textbook if you'd like to look at them. But... A profits interest is generally going to be taxable when I receive the profits at a later date. The partnership payment for services is either expensed or capitalized and amortized, depending on what the services were used to, to construct or buy or, or whatever. If they're deductible, the de deduction is going to be taken when the partner recognizes the services in income. So we match that. We match the deduction and their income recognition. The deduction is going to be allowed allocated to all the partners except the service partner. So the, the service partner, the one who provided the service, won't be allowed to take a deduction for that. And then partnership gain or loss. If a partnership, a partnership will recognize gain or loss in the proportionate share of its assets deemed transferred to the service partner. And then it will adjust the basis of the assets for the recognized gain or loss. And we will do an example to illustrate that. I don't know why this is blurry. Um, There's problem 9-28 in your book if you want to follow along there. Sean is admitted to the calendar year XYZ partnership on December 1st of the current year in return for his services managing the partnership's business during the year. The partnership reports ordinary income of $100,000 for the current year without considering this transaction. Assume a non-leap year and that the partners agree to the proration method with a calendar day convention. A, what are the tax consequences to Sean and the calendar year XYZ partnership if Sean receives a 20% capital and profits interest in the partnership with a $75,000 fair market value? So Sean contributed services, so we know this is a taxable transaction if Sean receives a capital interest, and he does. He receives a capital interest, a 20% capital and profits interest, and it has a fair market value. So we know Sean is going to have income ordinary income to the amount of $75,000, the fair market value of the 20% interest. And he is also going to have a $75,000 basis in his partnership interest. He essentially paid for that interest with service. So we value it at what he paid for it. So $75,000 in his partnership interest. The partnership will get a deduction of $75,000 as compensation. And that deduction will be allocated only to the old partners, not Sean. Sean is the service partner. The service partner. The partnership also recognizes gains and losses as if 20% of each asset had been sold at its fair market value to pay for Sean's services. So this was that last thing we talked about on the this last slide we looked at. We pretend like we sold 20% of our assets to pay Sean for his services. So if we had done that, if we had sold these assets, they would have been sold at fair market value and we would have had a gain or a loss. So the basis of each asset having a gain or loss related to it will be adjusted upward or downward by the amount of gain or loss recognized. So we will recognize gain or loss and then we will adjust the basis of those assets accordingly. Any gains allocated to the old partners will increase their basis in their partnership interests and any deductions or losses will decrease their basis. Also, the $100,000 of current year ordinary income will be allocated under the varying interest rule. 
We didn't. We have not really covered that. It's in your book if you'd like to cover it. But basically, we allocate income to the day. So, par, uh, let's see. Sean joined the partnership on December one. So, January one through November thirtieth, all of that income deduction loss, all of those income items will be allocated only to the old partners. Anything that happened December 1 through this through December 31 will be allocated to all the partners now, including Sean. Now, the varying interest rule simplifies that and says at the end of the year, we'll just take the results of operations and allocate it based on time. So I don't have to keep up with, well, I sold an asset on December 15th, and we're going to allocate that to all the partners, including Sean. But then I sold two assets on February 2nd, and I'm only going to allocate that to the other partners we can just look at the total result of operations at the end of the year and allocate it based on time. So that's what this, this calculation you're seeing old partners in Sean is. Part B, what are the tax consequences to Sean and the XYZ partnership if Sean receives only a 20% profits interest with no determinable fair market value? Remember, a profits interest is only the right to share in future income. And generally, it's not taxable except for with some limited exceptions, which I mentioned previously. So this came about in the Soul Diamond case. That's what they're citing there. If an ascertainable fair market value exists for the interest, the value must be reported as income. It's usually not, though. So, however, if the 20% interest has no ascertainable fair market value, which is what we have here, and which is the common treatment of such profits interest, neither Sean nor the XYZ partnership has any current tax consequences except that the ordinary income is going to be allocated just like it was in Part A under the varying interest rule. In addition, the IRS will not treat the receipt of a profits interest as a taxable event unless one of the events occur. These are the three exceptions I was talking about that we're not really going to deal with in this course. In a partnership formation, we might have some organization and syndication expenditures, these are just like the organization expenditures we talked about when the corporation had formed, and we treat them the same way. This should feel familiar. Usually I have to capitalize these. That's the general rule, but Section 709 allows me to immediately expense 5,000 of them in the tax year I begin business, and that's phased out dollar for dollar for the amount of organization expenditures that exceed $50,000. This is just like our treatment for corporate formation. The remaining amounts can be deducted over 180 months. Section 709 is deemed elected. If I choose not to elect it, I can choose not to elect it, but after I make my choice, it's irrevocable. I can't change my mind. And the same rules applicable to corporate organizational expenditures are going to apply here. So we've been talking about the partner's basis and the partnership interest. That's called the outside basis. We know it starts with the sum of money contributed or the value of services contributed plus his or her basis in contributed property plus share of liabilities assumed by the partner minus the partner's liabilities assumed by the partnership. If we contribute services, we begin with, we begin with the amount of income recognized and we add share of partnership liabilities assumed by the partner. We subtract partner's liabilities assumed by the partnership. The partner's holding period in the partnership interest includes the transfer's holding period for the contributed property if that property is a capital asset or Section 1231 property in the transfer or's hands. And if not, it begins the day after the contribution date if it's ordinary income property in the hands of the transfer or. The partnership's basis in the property is what we call the inside basis. And the partnership's basis for contributed property is equal to the property's basis in the hands of the contributing partner unless the partner recognizes gain on the contribution because the partner is an investment company. And if there is gain, if there is gain, excuse me, if the partner recognizes gain because of the assumption of liabilities, the partnership's basis in that property does not increase. The character of contributed property, excuse me, the character of contributed ordinary income property is generally retained by the corporation. So the IRS is trying to prevent shifting of ordinary income losses 
to partnerships. This says corporation, it should say partnership. That's an error on my part, sorry about that. The character of contributed ordinary income property is generally retained by the partnership. So if I, as a partner, contribute unrealized receivables. So unrealized receivables are any right to payment for goods or services. They're unrealized if the holder hasn't included them in income. So if I am a cash basis taxpayer and someone owes me money, I haven't included that in income because I haven't received it. So if I contribute those, those receivables, they're going to retain their ordinary income character at the partnership level. If I contribute inventory, inventory is ordinary income property, if I contribute inventory to the partnership, it's going to retain its character as ordinary income property for five years. If I contribute capital loss property, remember I like capital gains, I don't really like capital losses because there's limitations on deduction. If I contribute capital loss property, loss upon sale within five years by the partnership is going to be treated as a capital loss to the extent it would have been on the date of contribution. So basically to the extent of its built-in loss. So if I contribute capital assets that are worth $10,000 and my basis is $12,000, I have a built-in $2,000 capital loss. If I then later sell them, three years later, the partnership sells them for $8,000, all right, remember the partnership took a $12,000 basis in those assets. So it has a $4,000 loss. Of that $4,000 loss, $2,000 will be a capital loss because it's the built-in capital loss at the time of contribution. And the other $2,000 will be whatever type of loss is determined by the partnership's use of the property. So it could be either capital or ordinary, just depending on how the partnership uses the property. The partnership's holding period in the assets is going to include the holding period of contributing partner regardless of the character of property in the hands of the contributing partner. Section 1245 and 1250 rules carry over to the partnership and they apply if property is later sold at a gain, but no recapture applies to the contributing partner upon contribution, even if a gain is recognized upon contribution. All contribution rules are going to apply whether or not the contribution occurs at formation or on a later date. So that means after a partnership is formed, I can contribute assets to a partnership in return for a partnership interest and not recognize taxation, assuming it's exempted by the normal rules we've been talking about. It, this non-recognition of gain doesn't have to occur only on the formation of, of a partnership. It can occur at later contributions as well. This is a really good summary of what we've talked about in your book. So it's organized between the types of contribution to a partnership, the property contribution or the services contribution, and then on the left side is the tax attributes of, of those contributions. So first, recognition of gain, loss, or income by the partner. If the partner contributes property, that's generally non-taxable. There are some exceptions. One, liabilities assumed by the partnership exceed the partner's pre-contribution basis. Two, the partnership is an investment partnership. Or three, it's a contribution followed by a distribution that is treated as a sale. And we talked on all three of those. If the partner contributes services, the services are taxable to the partner to the amount of the fair market value of the partnership interest received. As we said, that's usually only a capital interest, not a profits interest, because normally a profits interest doesn't have a, a value. The basis of the partnership interest to the partner, this is the outside basis. If the partner contributes property, that interest is a substituted basis from the property contributed plus the share of the partnership liabilities assumed minus the partner's liabilities assumed by the partnership. Gain is going to be recognized because of the investment company rules. Any gain recognized because of the investment company rules is going to increase the basis. If the partner contributes services, the basis of that partnership interest is the amount of income recognized plus the share of partnership liabilities assumed by the partner minus the partner's liabilities assumed by the partnership. At the partnership level, we're going to look at gain or loss now. So if the partnership receives assets, property, no gain or loss is going to be recognized. 
If the partnership receives services, they get a deduction or capitalized expense, depending on the type of service rendered, and then there's going to be a gain or loss recognized equal to the difference between the fair market value of the portion of assets used to pay the service partner and the basis of such por portion of the assets. And finally, the basis of the assets to the partnership. This is the inside basis. So if the partnership receives property, it's going to be a carryover basis, and it's then going to be increased by a partner's gain recognized only if the gain results from the formation of an investment partnership. There's going to be no basis adjustment, however, when we make a when we assume liabilities. In a sale transaction, the assets take a cost basis. If the partnership receives services, the basis of the assets to the partnership are going to be increased or decreased to reflect the fair market value of the assets paid to the service partner. The partnership also has to make certain elections when it begins business. Section 706 requires the partnership select the highest ranked tax year from the ranking that follows. Okay, so I will let you look at this in your book. I'm not going to make you do these aggregate deferral tests, but I do want you to understand that the purpose of these tests is to select a tax year that results in the least amount of income deferral. And you're going to do that by looking at the partners. And we're going to start with the partner that owns the most the highest percentage of the partnership. So we're going to run through these tests and we're going to pick the partnership year in that results in the least amount of deferral. There could be the IRS may grant permission for the partnership to use a year end, a fiscal year end, if it has a natural business year. If the partnership doesn't have a natural business year, it either uses the tax year end required by section 706, which is the calculation that allows for the least deferral, or elect a fiscal year in under section 444 and make a required payment that approximates the tax due on the deferred income. Some other elections a partnership must make are all the elections that can affect the computation of taxable income derived from the partnership. These include the accounting method, the inventory method, and then the depreciation method.